Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for attending my talk. So today we'll be talking about Marquez. It's an open source solution for the aggregation, collection, and visualization of metadata uh, around a data ecosystem. Uh, we'll also go into sort of the how you can use Marquez to explore and visualize your data sets, and also things like enabling data abstraction, data lineage, and event-based triggers. But you know, first, let me introduce myself. I'm Willie, a data engineer at uh, WeWork. I work on the open source project Marquez. Uh, so we kind of focus on making data sets meaningful and discoverable using data sets. And of course, I'm at uh, Twitter, WS and Luchuk. So before we go into my talk, I do want to introduce WeWork a little bit. Uh, so one thing that we do provide is space. Uh, so that's really providing a, an environment for teams of any sizes to collaborate. That means booking rooms, um, sort of providing kitchens so that way people can go and sort of have lunch and, 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 and fresh coffee. Uh, we also provide a community. So that's, uh, we have an internal app that allows people to connect with one another, whether it's local, within their WeWork, or globally. Uh, so you can imagine, hey, I have some uh, UX sort of uh, mock-ups that I'm looking for feedback on and maybe getting feedback from a JavaScript developer or someone in design. Um, so that's the kind of uh, offer, offers we do have. And then the last, last one is services. So things like, so we take care of IT, we do provide things around payroll and, and so forth. Um, right now we work, we have over 250,000 uh, members globally. 280, almost 300 physical locations. We're in 72 cities and 23 countries. So for my talk today, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look into, the sort of ask the question, why metadata? And really what that means is why contextualize your data? Um, we're going to look into a room booking pipeline. So we work, you know, one of the big things is people want to book rooms, uh, mainly is if it's for interviews or if they sort of want to do one-on-ones, room bookings is a pretty important part um, of joining, uh, joining WeWork. We're going to look into sort of the naive approach of how you would, you, you would define that pipeline not using Marquez, and then I'm going to go into sort of the quick intro into Marquez and then revisit that same pipeline, uh, sort of addressing some of the problems that do come up but solving them with Marquez. And then we'll go, go into sort of future work for the, for the project and you know, maybe get someone, someone from uh, the audience to come and contribute to the project. So why, why metadata? Well, you want to manage and utilize metadata mainly for data quality. So you know, a lot of the time you kind of go into an organization, maybe it's your first day, and you kind of ask, okay, you guys are data, you guys are data driven, that's great. Um, let me know all about your, your data. And usually you just get, well, we have Redshift, we have a data warehouse, and that's where all of our data is. So really that equates to a data blob, and there's actually no context. I mean, tables do help, but is the data quality where it should be, are fields missing, what kind of, row, are we doing validation at the row level, column level, things like that. So you do want to build trust in, the, in your data so that way when, let's say if I'm a data scientist and I'm getting data from a data engineer or a different team, you want to make sure that, you know what, you validated your data, you sort of made sure that the, the, it's, the data set is well documented and there's an owner associated with that. The other one becomes data lineage. So that's really comes out, what that really means is what's the origin of your data set and what, what data sets were derived based off that data set. So as data goes, makes its way in through, through your data platform, there'll be things like transformations, uh, filtering, and, and so forth. Uh, you want to know what stages of your data um, went through uh, throughout, throughout its, its time. So you can think about data lifecycle management in that case. The other one becomes democratization of data sets. That's pretty critical. So you should be able to look, uh, sort of get a really, uh, you should be able to get a view of your data uh, landscape. So if I, so again, if it's my first day and I want to know what data sets are, what data sets are accessible to me, if I have to write a report or do some analysis, it would be great to know uh, that I have a central portal or some UI that I can start searching uh, for data sets. And that's really building a, a self-service data culture. So not really asking teams, but really being more like, okay, let me answer the questions myself because I have the tools uh, to do it. And that's all leading to creating a healthy data ecosystem. 
So a few things sort of that we already talked about, but self-service, really about discovery and exploration and providing that global context. Um, so the freedom to experiment. So you can think here, um, if I'm going to start at looking at different data sets now that I have the ability to discover and explore the different data sets in my org, I didn't want to then write jobs that use those data sets to, you know, maybe, maybe uh, generate different reports that I find interesting, um, then be able to deploy jobs into my platform uh, with, and have that flexibility where I can say, here are the data sets for my job, and at that point, go ahead and produce the, the output data sets as well. So it's all about being self-sufficient. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of what, uh, what that point's uh, trying to make. And of course, accountability, and these are two things. One is that if your job is running and it's producing, producing data, is it producing 250 gigs a week, a day? You want to associate the amount of data that a team produces to sort of say, hey, you know, you guys are sort of really high offenders. Maybe there's a reason for it. But you do want to associate cost to teams based off the data that they produced. So in the, in the past, I've uh, sort of ran uh, jobs and it's mostly about dealing with, okay, so there's a QA, um, so we have customer, customer support and someone wants to know, hey, this person has booked, uh, you know, 50 rooms in the past month and I want to sort of get a report on that. So sometimes you can't really associate that with a cost. It's sort of as a data engineer, okay, I'll do it, I'll write the job and sort of run it. But how do you, how do you sort of validate that? What data engineering is doing is providing value. So the one way you could do that is associated costs. Like this is obviously a re there's obviously a reason why we ran that job. And of course, trust is the other thing. So if I'm accountable for my data sets and I make, I make sure that they are valid and that I put in the time to sort of provide descriptions and so forth, maybe at the field level or column level if, I'm, if it's going to be a table, um, that you do build that trust across teams. Because a lot of time what you do see is sort of teams that are very siloed and data scientists, they're very savvy. So if they don't trust your da the data, they'll have scripts that pull in, into, pull in from direct data, data sources into their own worldview. And then you kind of get that sort of, um, sort of disjunction between, between teams. So, okay, so back to the room booking uh, uh, sort of pipeline that we're gonna be working on. Let's actually book a room and see what that looks like. So the first thing we're gonna do is choose a location and floor. In this case, in a, you know, in, we have a new, new office actually opened up in uh, SF. Uh, so I'm gonna choose a Salesforce tower and we have about two members that I'm looking to book a room for. So we're gonna need about one or four seats and it's sometime today actually, so that's awkward. Um, so the other one is we're going to choose an open time. Uh, time slot here were actually some peak hours. So I found one towards the end of the day because everyone uh, enjoys late meetings. But in this case, it's from four to five. That's a bummer. Uh, the other one, then we're gonna actually confirm, confirm that booking. So that's generally the flow. And what we're going to, we're actually tasked with now is just sort of choosing which location has the most bookings. So it seems pretty obvious uh, that it kind of equates to this. We have a set of room bookings and we just want to know the top location. Okay, so we're gonna approach it in a naive way, uh, but to be honest with you, I think a lot of people approach it this way, so um, it's actually quite a, quite a right. The requirements that we have is we're just going to read a room bookings uh, from some data source we don't know yet. We're gonna sum those room bookings and um, return the top location, so that's gonna be your business logic. Uh, so we're gonna write that top location once we do calculate it into some uh, output data source. And of course, we're gonna run it once an hour. So let's say we, you know, reached out to some teams, we kind of eventually figured out that, you know what, our input data for room bookings is in S3 and it's gonna be in a CSV file. That's great um, because that's easy to parse um, and also get wrong. So here we're gonna have a location, in this case it's just some ID and some timestamp in which the booking actually happened and also the room. So in this case, it's just going to be um, a, a room number. And what our business logic is going to do is just gonna say, great, let me process that CSV file for that particular hour, and we're just going to reinsert a record into our Postgres database that says, here's the, here's the top location for that particular time that we ran the job, and we're also gonna take into account the bookings. So the reason for that is that we're gonna plot these data points. So it's kind of, it would be nice to know how many room bookings happened uh, during, during that hour. 
So this is actually not too bad. This is what we have, it's running, and I feel pretty good about it. You know, there's a lot of steps that went into it uh, that we didn't really go deep into, but in general, we do have a job with a, that represents our workflow, that reasons from S3, and writes to Postgres. And we have a scheduler, so it runs on an interval um, of every hour. But we do have some interesting dependencies. One is the upstream dependency. There's some job that owns by, that's owned by some team that's archiving the, data, uh, the room bookings into S3. And the other one becomes, well, we do have a, upstream, a downstream dependency. Well, the dashboard has an upstream dependency on our workflow, so we do have to make sure that uh, we're providing those data points in a timely, uh, timely manner. So those are actually some problems. So here, we're actually gonna keep track of problems that we run into while we're defining this, our pipeline. One of them is going to be, what's our jobs input data set? So a lot of the time, you know, you do either you use Slack or message someone directly or send out an uncomfortable email, by the way, I need room booking data, uh, room bookings are, where can I find them? Is it in a database or are they sort of distributed in S3 and also a database? Those questions actually do come up um, and some things that do need to be answered. The other one becomes, does a data set have an owner? A lot of time it doesn't. Um, I've experienced in the past where I ask for a data set and someone says, yeah, it's being pulled into our data warehouse from, from a cron that no one really knows why it's being pulled in, but it actually makes its way into our, uh, the calculations for end, end, uh, uh, end report. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So we definitely want to know who the owner is. That's pretty critical. And also how often is the data set updated? just in general because we want to know how often we need to run our job. So in our case, we, our requirement was updating, updating it every hour, but is that really what's happening in that data set itself? So we were told it was every hour, but do we really trust that team? That's, that's what we want to answer. So great, we were running a production, and I can't remember the last time I wrote a bug, so I'm a little confused on what's going on here. So we have a job that's failing, that's great. And I think logs are really, efficient and sort of a cheap way to figure out what's going on when your job is failing. So I check the logs and I'm like, oh, okay, we're seeing serialization exceptions, or deserialization exceptions everywhere in the logs. So I'm thinking this might be our input data set, which actually is. Um, they actually changed the type of the field for rooms. So even eventually they said, you know what, we need to also account for rooms with uh, letters, so they ended up just changing the type of room bookings from an integer to a string to account for uh, the character that comes after. Would have been great if I was told about that. So let's actually add that to our problem. We need to coordinate changes, because I don't want to be woken up at two o'clock in the morning about some, some change uh, specific to an upstream dependency. Unless you guys do, I'm not sure. But we wanna, we, so we wanna, we wanna fix that. I was able to f realize what's going on. It was a quick patch. So, um, but before we get to that, uh, we do want to actually note that there's gaps in our output data set. Because uh, remember, we do have a dashboard that relies on the output of our job every hour. And this one's important, because I think uh, our CEO is looking at it. So we gotta, we gotta fix this. So the, the, okay, I'm sorry. It looked weird on my screen. Um, so we do have to account for gaps in our data. At one point, our job did stop, in this case from uh, hour six and seven. Our job start, uh, stopped actually uh, producing, producing res uh, output. So let's actually add that to our growing list of problems. We need to figure out backfills. So to recap what we have so far, we have a job that I feel pretty good about. Um, it doesn't handle things all that well. We did have to explore and understand where our input was coming from, um, the downstream dependencies in our case was a, a dashboard, so we have to always think, that, think about that particular dashboard in the back of our mind, and we have now a job that runs on a schedule. And we also have these lists of problems, so that's a lot. But writing a job shouldn't be this hard, and if you're thinking that, I'm, I was actually thinking the same thing um, before I joined WeWork, and I'll, actually a lot of the things that we're addressing at WeWork really has this sort of question, uh, this question always, always comes up, and what we ended up coming up with was Marquez. So it's an open source project that um, should and will actually help uh, resolve a lot of the problems that we ran into in our example pipeline. So 
first and foremost, it's a metadata service. So as you can imagine, you have jobs that are running and they're reporting metadata about its runtime, uh, sort of what its inputs and output data sets are. And all the, this, we actually capture all this metadata through REST APIs. So at the core of Marquez, it's just a centralized metadata management. So a great catalog of metadata about your jobs and data sets. It's also modular, so there's things like data discovery, data health, and data triggers, which we will go into individually and kind of expand on, on those ideas. But they're all built around the core model of Marquez and the metadata that it's, it's collecting. So the first module is search, and that's just a unified search. So before I talked about, you know, what makes a really solid data, eco, uh, data ecosystem is search, searchability of your data sets. And that's something that's built into Marquez. So as jobs are reporting its inputs and output data sets, you then will be able to start indexing, sort of doing syncs from uh, the, core, the core database into a search engine and start indexing and ranking based off a few things. So possibly it could be, does your data set have a description? If so, we'll probably want to bump that up. Um, and also, so in this case, we're looking for documentations so like owner, schema, and data sources. That's very important to us and th something we should, be, we should be collecting. So generally what that kind of looks like, I'm gonna search for room bookings and I'll go ahead and get some tags associated with my searches. So for room bookings in SF, that data source is in S3. Uh, so you can think of tags as just a way to add even more context or more metadata on the metadata that you're collecting. Um, so another example would maybe be PII, but in this case, that's not really a concern. And then of course you get a list of all the data sets that match that search term. The other one becomes health. So this in general is like, well, you know, I want to know generally are the values, are the values that are present in that data set, those data points, are they correct? Are they, um, are they actually accurate? Um, are there gaps in the data itself? And does it have a schema? I want to know that if I'm reading a data set that I know the types the field, of the fields and also the description. And at the same time, I also want to know where it's located and if you look at the sort of the, the second to the last point there about size, you kind of want to know over time how your data set actually grows. Um, if you start seeing drops, there could be sort of an upstream issue with the de job that's producing that data set and you, wanna be, you, want, you kind of want to have those type of checks to make sure that something didn't actually go wrong. So you want to see growth over time and also the number of records uh, would also be, be great to know as well. And sort of the last piece with lineage, once you have sort of general view and you kind of uh, know what teams own what data sets, you'll be able to start running lineage queries. So let's actually step into that. So if you have a data graph, and in this case we have nodes that represent jobs and the edges themselves are just sort of containers of data and they represent data sets. So a lineage query kind of looks like this where I have a data set and I wanna know how, I, how it got to this point. What jobs did it go through over time that resulted in the, the, the data set that I currently have now. So I wanna know the origin and the, process, the, the tr transformations uh, that happened. So the last module is uh, triggers. Uh, so this is all about timely processing of data. So right now what you kinda have is sort of a framework that usually uh, wakes, wakes a process up and says is this job done or is my data that I'm expecting where, where it should be. So we want to remove that sort of whole, that, that sort of resource intensive process out of the equation. So no pulling. I'm pretty excited about that. The, the other one becomes a reduction of manually handling backfills. So I'm not sure about you, but a lot of the time I get very much rushed into um, producing a pipeline and what would happen is I usually rarely ever think about ba uh, backfills. Because that usually requires a separate approach, it's not really a one-to-one -one mapping. It's like, okay, I need to rerun a pipeline and that's it. Usually there's a little bit more involved. So we wanna reduce that. And also the reduce the production of bad data. So what I mean by that is that if your job does come up and there is data in that S3 bucket, for example, it might not be all the data that you expect. So you could have it where the, it, the data that makes its way into that, that bucket that you expect is about 15 minutes behind, so you're only working with a portion of the data. The other one becomes low quality, um, 
avoiding low quality data. So what I mean by that is that if you do trigger, uh, so let's say in this case, uh, we have the module trigger that's listening for data changes. So as new data arrives, it will be able to say, okay, there's new data, that's great, it's, co it's complete, but is the data quality there? So if, if you could think about payments, um, that's a pretty big one. So you don't want to get that wrong. So if there's an upstream bug that you're aware about, you don't want to actually trigger the jobs downstream that depend on that data set, especially if you're dealing, dealing with payments. So here's an example where we have a job that's failing upstream. And here are the affected paths. So if I'm downstream from this, I'm probably getting alerts and I'm a little concerned like what's going on, but with Marquez and this visual uh, component of it, you'll be able to actually do a quick search, a uh, lineage search to see where the data is, uh, what's the path of the data, and then actually have this sort of visual component where if the job is red, for example, there's actually an outage. So if you click on that node, you'll be able to know the owner and how to contact them. So let's say we do, and we call them up, it's like, yo, what's going on? And they're like, oh, we're already looking into it and we're applying a patch. So I'm like, oh, that was easy. I'll go back to sleep. So let's, when they do apply the patch, we'll actually have cascading triggers. So they'll apply the patch in their code, and then at that point, any, any job downstream will actually get the trigger event to say, hey, by the way, there's new data that you have to process, re possibly rewrite that data that was bad, and insert this in new data into, into your, um, your database or, or something like that. I think that's really convenient. Uh, there's very little involvement there. It's all sort of done through, sy through system, uh, system calls. So let's actually walk in, uh, walk in uh, through some of the core concepts of Marquez. So when everyone thinks about jobs, they usually think about an input and output data set. Uh, so you have a job working with a static input data set and writing a static output data set. But what Marquez actually introduces is the notion of versions. Um, so a version is really just a snapshot of your data at some point in time, so you could keep adding data, and it will, actually let me see my, okay, yeah, so my, my next slides actually cover that. So you have this, you keep adding data, and that could be an insertion into a table. Uh, every time you do that insertion, it does create a new immutable version of that data set. So then you could do things like delta, so what was the different, what was the diff or delta between version two and version three? Because you do have different types of jobs. One is non-incremental jobs, which just say, I'm gonna just gonna process data from scratch. Uh, then you do have some that are incremental where they just wanna work with the diff. So it's kind of nice to know what difference, what was the diff between version two and version three of the data set? And the other one becomes full um, incremental. So again, in that case, uh, it's the uh, same concept as new, uh, non-incremental, uh, it's just processing the entire data set. And it wants to work with the uh, current version uh, of the data set. We also, Marquez actually introduces the concept of job versioning. In this case, so anytime your business logic changes, for example, uh, you will have a Git SHA associated with that. We actually want to collect to know what job is associated with that, with that change, or what code was associated with that change. So that way we can tie ver, uh, input versions of a data set to the, its output version. We, we also do capture job runs. So as a job runs, uh, we do actually begin, uh, we do default a, job, uh, a new job version to new, and as it's running, it's going to communicate to Marquez, hey, I'm running, change my state. When I'm finished, the data set part will actually, uh, Marquez will know, okay, this data set has now been updated. We want to actually uh, trigger, uh, uh, trigger jobs to, uh, to actually process that, that new version of the data set. There are also things around job failures. So a job will be running and they do fail quite often. So we also want to report a state of, uh, a state of failure. Now it's possible that a job can't report its failure. So we are looking into things like a job timeout and after let's say maybe 30 minutes, we want to flip the, the, the state of that job to failed. And that reason why that's important is that you do, if your d data set is delayed, so are the downstream jobs dependency on that, uh, on that data set. So they all get delayed. So what are some design benefits 
Uh, one is early upstream failure detection, which we, we kind of look through. Uh, that allows you to say, you know what, my job is failing. Uh, I need to look into it really quickly because there are uh, downstream jobs that depend on my job completing. And also debugging. So when you have job versions and uh, data set versions, you'll be able to run queries to say, what, if I have version two of my job, what were the version of the data set that resulted in that job running? And sort of recoverability, which I went through, uh, went through sort of full incremental processing. So as jobs, uh, different jobs have different requirements, and one reading from scratch, uh, sort of the job saying, I'm going to wipe out my data, whether it's a table, I'm going to wipe it out, run my computation, and repopulate it with the my resulting uh, calculations from that new data set version. And of course, coordination. This is around cross, cross team coordination. Uh, you know, if something does go wrong, uh, it's, you are easy, easily able to identify the owner of that job and the owner of the, of the data set. So now we're actually going to look into the data model of Marquez at a really high level. There's a lot more involved than kind of what you see here, what we're going to go through. But at the very high level, we have jobs that have one or more versions, and those versions have one or more data sets. And here, when I say data sets, I'm talking about logical names of data sets. So it's sort of a universal global name that people can identify a data set. Um, it's actually not tied to the job itself. Um, we tie those to the versions. So initially, when you register a job, it's sort of a really, really sort of basic metadata that you would expect, sort of the description, the owner, and the input and output data sets. But those, the inputs and output data sets, get tied to a job version when you make an API call, which allows you to do job runs. So every version, a job version, creates instances of job runs. And those actually produce the data set version. So after a job completes, it does need to write to the physical store, uh, whether it's S3, so if you're appending to an S3 uh, bucket, you will actually do that first, and then you'll actually tell Marquez, by the way, I've updated my room bookings data set with new data, I need, to, I need to actually version it. Which puts us into the data source types. So at a high level, we care about DB tables, we do care about file systems, uh, versioning, versioning file systems, and stream. Uh, so streaming, uh, with WeWork, we do have a huge initiative for IoT, uh, data, collecting IoT data around our office space. So we're looking into stream lineage. In terms of metadata collection, it's actually done through an API. Um, nothing too crazy here. We do have a diverse set of languages uh, used at WeWork, and we need language-specific SDKs. And one of them, uh, two of them actually, is going to be Python and Java. So as a job is running, it's going to be reporting uh, to Marquez via uh, an API call. As we scale, I think there's going to be different ways we do approach this, but I think to get to sort of gain adoption, it's all going to be done through HTTP, and then maybe in the future, we're looking into uh, processing log files and stitching things together that way. But what we care about in terms of data collection is when a job does come up, and has to connect to a data source, that's the, that's the area that we really do care about. And that's where we want report uh, metadata to be sent to Marquez. And at the end of the job, where it has to connect to that data source, where it has to write to, that becomes a pretty critical component as well. We're not really capturing lineage or transformation that happened within the job, but just at, a, at sort of at a high level at the, job, at the job level, what are the inputs and output data sets? Generally, what that wor workflow looks like is a job is registered, in this case, job version, the inputs and output data sets, the logical names, the owner and description, so what I mentioned before. Uh, we do register a job run. Uh, what, what this kind of looks like is you do make an API call out to a job uh, and you sort of execute a run and you get back a run ID, which is unique, that you could then start updating state. So you update the job state at different parts where you start and complete. And then when you finally finish with your processing after you've ingested your data, you want to register the output uh, data set. In this case, it's going to be the physical location because eventually Marquez needs to know where that data set is located. So it needs a pointer uh, to that data source. So we're actually going to revisit the room bookings pipeline and see how Marquez can help out. So recall, we had to analyze, uh, we had a task to analyze room booking trends, and we came up with something pretty decent. We had a job, and 
S3 was our input and the output was Postgres feeding a dashboard. Uh, that kept trends of top locations. And we also had these set of problems and let's actually address them one by one. Yeah. But in this case using Marquez. So we're gonna use the UI to search for room bookings before we had uh, to either send out an email or do a really, you know, do an at here out of the Slack, uh, in a Slack channel, which no one really likes, uh, to find out where the room bookings data sets are. And here it was actually pretty easy. We were able to find it almost immediately with the, since we're indexing all the data sets that we're collecting. And here we have all data sets. Um, a few things that, so when we click on the room booking data set, we actually know a few things about uh, about that data set, one being the owner. So in this case, data engineering, and it's updated hourly. And also we know the location. It's in some S3 bucket uh, called room bookings, and it's gonna be the raw, raw values. But as a bonus, we do get the schema. So at WeWork, our data platform uh, uses uh, the Confluent Schema Registry, and this is just a pointer to, to, uh, to that schema. In this case, the version is, it was actually the first version, so it's version one. So in this case, we, what's our jobs input data set? Uh, we knew it was room bookings, we know where it's located, so we can actually check that off. Uh, does the data set have an owner? We actually do know that. Uh, it's data engineering, great. And the other one becomes, uh, the other question that we have was how often is the data set updated? We know that it's hourly now. We can check that off. We're actually doing pretty good. So if we go to the next problem, we also had to coordinate changes um, of our input data set. So in our view, uh, we only see room bookings as it failing, and we had this upstream dependency that was archiving uh, our data set. But really, if you look at a global view, there was actually unexpected uses of our uh, top locations. We thought it was just feeding a dashboard, but there was actually other engineers that realized that that was an interesting data set that they wanted to use, so they started writing jobs that used our calculations. That's a surprise to me at least. So in this case, we also want, uh, we're gonna use Marquez to figure out how we can get to that data, uh, the change in the data set. So remember that we had the CSV file uh, the, the type of the data, set, uh, the type of the room, uh, the uh, booking, uh, the room number changed from an int to a string. If we were using sch uh, a schema registry, which now Marquez kind of forces you to provide schemas for your data sets. So now we just realize, oh, there was a version bump. Let's actually patch the code, deploy, and then trigger downstream jobs. So in terms of coordination, this one is a little interesting. I mean, there is sort of still required the to debugs, like, hey, I did, my job is failing, but you don't have to reach out to a team. You could just use the, uh, the Marquez UI to realize, you know what, I have an input data set. Let me just see the last time it was updated. And it does allow sort of this self-service uh, notion to debug your problem. So we could coordinate, coordinate changes is still still kind of a problem, but we could check it off because now it doesn't require me to go to a team. I can just kind of solve those, those data problems uh, myself. And also backfills, since we do utilize triggers, we can actually remove back, uh, backfills from the, from the issue as well. Because it's no longer a manual process. Uh, we can patch our code and the Marquez will realize that that job just finished. It has an output data set. And we can actually trigger, trigger downstream jobs that depend on that data set. Uh, so to recap, we wanted to make data sets tr uh, trivial to uh, discover. And with the Marquez UI and the metadata that's collected, I think we, we achieved that. We also wanted to use uh, m metadata for global uh, context for debugging. So if our job's failing and our data sets are not in a healthy state, we want to be able to identify what the problem is really quickly. The other one becomes easily handling of backfills. Which triggers, uh, there's a lot more you can do than just backfills, but that is what we used it for, and it actually makes d data sets as dependencies and reverses jobs, de sort of dependencies between jobs. And we, we kind of say, well, dependencies are the most, data sets are the most critical part in data pipelines, because a lot of people, when they write pipelines, they think, well, I have to write code, and it's gonna produce some data, but I don't really care about the output. Well, 
they do, but a lot of the time you don't, you have a lot of tools for visualizing what happens at the code level, but right now there's very little in terms of what happens when you actually produce your data set and how healthy, how th healthy it is. So I think there could be a lot more done to visualize and provide the right context to uh, sort of debug those type of uh, problems. So future work, uh, one thing's important, WeWork does use Marquez pretty heavily and uh, we do have a team that supports the, the main maintaining and development of features. And Marquez is built around, uh, our data platform is built around Marquez. So the core of our platform uh, it's, it's around, a metadata, uh, around metadata. And then we're building integrations with scheduling. So we have a team at New York dealing, uh, that manages scheduling and actually, actually just Airflow. So we're looking at integrating Marquez with Airflow and using Marquez to trigger workflows in Airflow. And it doesn't replace Airflow, it just sort of says, hey, by the way, we have possibly five or 10 instances of Airflow running and that could be Every instance could be mapped to a team or a particular uh, use case. We want to we want to be able to say, you know what, one workflow from one Airflow instance just finished, and how do we trigger that other workflow that's in a separate instance? And the way you could do that is with triggers uh, from Marquez. The other one becomes batching. The abstraction uh, part is actually pretty important here. So we have a batching layer a team out in uh, Tel Aviv, which is managing our Spark uh, our Spark cluster. And we're looking into using Marquez as a way to say, I have a job and I have logical names for my inputs and output data sets. And there's a thin data API client that says, tell me actually where this data source is located. So where's the physical location of the data? And then it actually continues computation. And the other one, since again, we are, we're really looking in, in exploring the IoT space, streaming becomes a really important one. So stream lineage is actually a really tough problem. So I do have office hours after this, so if anyone wants to talk about that, um, that'd be amazing. So our roadmap, short term, we have a release in Marquez. It's, uh, we're looking at a 010 release, and that's really just finalizing the, uh, the APIs. So we have a job API, data set API, and one thing I didn't talk about was namespaces, so you want to be able to group your jobs based off some context. So you have uniqueness within a, within a namespace for your jobs and data sets, but you want to tie owners to namespaces. And that's, that's sort of the APIs that we're looking at finalizing. And again, there's an open PR around the open API spec, so if anyone wants to provide feedback, that'd be, that'd be great. And of course, we're, we're looking at uh, providing more documentation around uh, sort of the goal, the goal of the project. And long term, I think it's very critical that the UI becomes a portal that people can go to from different backgrounds where, this, where the marketing, data scientists, data, data engineers, the UI becomes the visual component of all the metadata that you've collected and queries that you'll be running to, event, to actually start visualizing it and create uh, 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 graphs around, around, you, around your data landscape. So here's, again, if you want to work on Marquez, um, we, do, we do have a, a Twitter handle, to check us out, and also here's our GitHub link if, you, if anyone's interested in contributing. Um, that's really all I had, actually, so thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk, first of all. Um, I had a question about the data set versioning. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, trying to understand the purpose of it, is it kind of an implementation detail to just say get rows since yesterday or is it a way to, uh, to like freeze a query or an export in time and be able to replay it at a later date? It's that latter part, right? It's that immutability to say, you know, what was that current state? Because you'll have jobs. So if you look at, as we're collecting metadata around job versions, that version of that job and that run has to be mapped to the data set version that it produced. So in order to actually understand, so a lot of time what happens when you're debugging a problem, it's actually a week uh, until you actually figure out what's going on. So if you can't relate it back to that job version, that code that produced that data set version, it doesn't really help out with debugging. So, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, in terms of integrations with other systems, you mentioned using Airflow, but uh, for other tools like Luigi or, or whatnot, how um, easy would it be to integrate with other systems? Would that mostly involve API calls back and forth? Pre pretty much, yeah. yeah. So with Airflow, what we're looking at doing, so you know, this was kind of nice. Airflow does have an API that you can actually kick off workflows. So what we're thinking about doing is 
we're providing a really clean interface that you can actually plug in. Uh, so for triggering, you can say, okay, here's an interface that uh, will send a message to whatever channel, like Kafka or SQS. Mm -hmm. And if you have a process listing downstream on those events, you can just say, okay, I have a new data set version. I know what workflows to execute. So that's really where integration comes in. And we're looking for contributions from all type of systems. Yeah. Um, there's one other with uh, AWS Glue. I don't know if you looked into that at all since that does data cataloging and discovery as well. Have you looked into any integrations between those? No, no I haven't, but okay. uh, let's talk after. Sure. Thank you. All right, last question. So uh, the way Marquez works is it takes the place of the scheduler and Airflow works just like a, like the DAG pipeline thing. So Marquez is actually responsible for triggering the jobs, right? It, it's not a, it's sort of a light trigger. Uh, in mm -hmm. the end, workflow still, man, uh, I'm sorry, Airflow still manages the workflow and still man, sort of internally still schedules, uh, so keeps dependencies, but Marquez is sort of saying, hey, you might want to trigger this workflow because some, some dependency on a particular workflow that Airflow is managing needs to kick off. So it's, sort of, it's sort of a, it's a partnership and certainly not a replacement. Are you guys already using it in production? Airflow? No, uh, Marquez. Uh, so right now we're actually working on, so we have an initial release out that has been collecting metadata and we're constantly iterating on it. So the version 010 release, has a lot to do from the learnings and that we've been, we've been uh, so it's, we have some beta teams that are testing it out and we've learned a lot from that. Yeah.